Good morning, welcome to Zaki Point Television. Today we are going to interview Dr. Rama Ramakrishnan, who is the founder and CEO of SeaQuotient. SeaQuotient is a SaaS based analytical software company that builds superior customer prediction models for the retail marketing decisions. Dr. Rama Ramakrishnan has also built many other companies prior to this and has been a senior lecturer at MIT Sloan School of Management. He also has a PhD in operations management from MIT and he's the author of a blog called Analytic Age. We're very excited to have him here today to share with you some of the insights and ways retailers should be thinking about their data and data analytics. Thank you, Rama, for joining us. Happy to be here. Today's interview, or today's discussion actually, I should say, is more really focused on retail analytics and how retailers could actually use that uh, towards customer acquisition and retention. Yeah. But before we actually kind of jump into the customer acquisition question, what is the state of uh, retail analytics broadly and, and kind of specifically merchandising versus customer acquisition problem? Well, I think overall I would say that uh, sort of the penetration of analytics in retail is still, it's still early days. Uh, retailers have been using data and reporting and so on for the longest time. Uh, if you go into any Monday morning meeting at a retailer, you will find them you know, working through copious reams of reports. But if you look at specifically decision support analytics for retailers, um, the penetration of that is still pretty low. Uh, some sectors of retail, some areas of retail decision making have received more attention from analytics, others have not. So for instance, if you look at the supply chain side of things, there's a fair amount of analytic technology that's used for supply chain. But if you shift your focus to, uh, to marketing, anything that's customer facing, you know, pricing, promotions, direct to customer marketing and so on, I think that you know we are still sort of in the first innings of a very long game, and uh, the penetration is still very low. I uh, see. But why is it so important for a retailer to think about this? You know, I think in my experience, uh, most categories of retail uh, are pretty mature. So if you are a medium to large size retailer competing in a mature category, uh, the only way you're going to show uh, same store sales growth, or as retailers call it, comps. Uh, the only way you can show that is essentially by obviously not rebuilding stores because that's not going to change the metric. It's by getting your customers to spend more with you than with the competition. Uh -huh. uh, that is sort of the, pre, you know, the, the preeminent way. Now if you describe this uh, piece of reasoning to retailers, they will obviously immediately agree with you. It's sort uh -huh. of self-evident. Yes. Now, So you would think that if the fundamental uh, driver for your business growth comes from convincing your customers to spend more with you, yeah. Clearly, a requirement for that is really understanding who your customers are, why they shop with you, why they shop with the competition, yeah. and so on and so forth. I so, see. customer knowledge must be a key driver. Yet, you know, where does customer knowledge come into decision making today in retail? It comes okay. in in a very sort of roundabout, tangential fashion. It doesn't come about in a day-to-day -day fashion. So, you talked a little bit about the types of data. Let's maybe dig into this more. Uh, what is important to collect, and where to find this for a retailer? Um, so, you know, as, as you know, there are lots of, many, many different kinds of data sources. Um, so, the data source that's perhaps the easiest for retailers to work with are their own point of sale transaction data, be it on the stores, be it on the website. Um, so, purchase data is, is obviously the one that the retailers own, they have immediate access to. Um, now, you can go further afield and enrich this data with third party, uh, what are called third party data appends using demographic data, psychographic data, and so on. And you can enrich these with website behavioral data. You know, what do people click on, what do they browse, and so on and so forth. And then finally, you can also mine social media data. You can look at your fan page on Facebook, what people are commenting on, what they're tweeting about, what the blogosphere is you know, talking about regarding your brand. You can bring all these data sources together to arrive at a better understanding of the customer. Makes, makes the life of a retail marketer even more complex. I mean, as it was, yes. uh, there's enough data to work with. So now with so many different sources, what, what, can, uh, what sort of modeling people should be thinking of? Uh, where should they begin first? That's a great question. Uh, I think while all this data some, sort of feels very overwhelming uh, and intimidating, I think the reality is that if you only started with your purchase data, the data that you actually own, that you can, you can touch, you don't have to get it from anybody else. That data is a gold mine. What people are buying, when they are buying, where they are buying, how much they paid for it, did they use a coupon or not, did they look for a price cut. These, this data is immediately available and it's incredibly full of insights if you know how to so interrogate the data. 
So I would say, don't worry about you know social media data. Don't worry about sort of the new hot uh, data sources. Take the data you have access to and try to extract more value from it. So that I think is the right starting point. Now, what sorts of models do you build to uh, to interrogate this data? I would say that um, sort of rather than focusing on modeling per se, mm -hmm. I would I would say take a decision that you currently make, mm -hmm. and then ask yourself. Given this decision, given the data that I have easy access to, is there a way to go from the data to the decision in such a way that I can make a better decision at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. So uh, let's take an example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, let's take pricing, right? Which obviously comes into the marketing function. If you so if you think about pricing and coupons, um, right now retailers email and direct mail coupons all the time to mm -hmm. their customers. And typically these coupons are, you know, they are sort of whatever they did last year, they will repeat it this year. Oh, we did a 20% coupon last, you know, with last Thanksgiving, we're going to do 20% this year. Mm -hmm. But now, and most retailers have the ability to have, you know, five, six different coupons for their customers. The question is, who gets which discount is, mm -hmm. the, is, is the key decision that has to be made. Yeah. So if you start with the decision and say, now, I'm going to go look at the data as to what, how people have responded to these coupons in the past. And yeah. then I'm going to connect, connect, make the bridge mm -hmm. between the two. You can actually lead to a better decision. Now, the wrong way to do this is to take the data and look for quote-unquote insights in the data without really knowing how you're going to use those insights mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. That I find is actually very unproductive. A lot of firms tend to do that. Mm -hmm. They sort of just wallow around in the data. As someone once said, they are, they are like gophers in soft dirt. They love what they are doing. I but see. but uh, I think Daryl Rigby of Bain said it in a, in a conference somewhere and I love the metaphor. I see. Because a lot of data analysts tend to just, just scurry around with the data, they are really happy doing Excel pivot tables and various analyses and whatnot. Uh -huh. But at the end of the day, you say, okay, okay what are you going to do with it? What's the so what of this? So there's, a, there's a deafening silence. So your big point really making is tying the analysis, the insights to a decision. Uh, surely people have been at least trying to get there, and I guess there must be some bottleneck here, some challenge. Is, is it that the data is not available for those types of decisions? That's a, I think that's a profound question, um, and my take on it is that there are sort of two uh, key bottlenecks. One bottleneck is if you don't start with a decision and work back to how can I make this a better decision using data and models and so on, if you don't have that sort of decision first framework in mind, 90% mm -hmm. of the time you waste your time. Okay. You will start with the data. If you start with the data and then work towards the decision, you'll get it wrong. But you have to start with the decision and work back to the data. That simple mindset shift is a key okay. bottleneck because it's really tempting to just dive into the data Got as it. opposed to sit and really think about whether, what is the decision, how do I make it better. Got it. The second bottleneck, which I think is probably harder, is the you know you can easily find it's sort of a human resource bottleneck. Mm -hmm. So you can find people who can analyze data. You yeah. can find people uh, who can actually act on what the data tells you. Yeah. But there's sort of a gap in the middle where the people who are good at an analysis. They are very reluctant, they lack the courage to step back and say, do I believe this analysis? And if I believe this analysis, what is the concrete recommendation that I can make to a decision maker, a line of business executive? The ability to go from what the data tells you mm -hmm. to actually acting on it. Okay. There's a huge gap there. And I feel that's actually the, the biggest part. Like we sort of at Sea Quotient, we call it the last mile of actionability. I see. You know, unless the last mile is bridged, nothing is going to happen. All the data, it's just data, the insight is just insight. In fact, I would go so far as to say, uh, the last thing that a busy executive needs is, a, is, a, is an insight. Because you know why? Because they have to, they have a day job to do. Yeah. And on top of that, now you have given them a quote unquote insight, and now they have to worry about what the heck they're going to do with this insight. Okay, okay. So maybe tell me a little bit more about Sea Quotient, how Sea Quotient is actually filling that gap. So our, so Sea Quotient was founded uh, on, with a mission of uh, taking customer level data uh, and infusing retail decisions with customer insight. Uh, like I said before, most retailers, they are sort of in a game in which they have to get the customers to spend more with them. And so we believe that the use of customer data will be very important. And we saw a gap in going from customer data to a customer decision in an as simple and painless way as possible. So that's what that's the premise on which Sequestion was founded. So what we're doing right now is we are um, we have, we have built a platform which takes decisions that the retailer makes that affects individual customers, such as you know who do I mail to, 
if I'm going to email someone, what should be in the email? And those those decisions, the individual uh, at that retailer is plugging into the system, or is that something you are, uh, you know, setting it up in the, in the system itself? Like, how do you know what decisions this particular individual needs to make? So, uh, so most retailers have a set of decisions. So what we do is we work with them to make sure that they are considering a larger set of decisions because. You know, to give you an analogy, if you have only sent uh, the same mail piece to every customer historically, just because you could sort of deal with more complexity, mm -hmm. uh, we tell them, you know, you can actually send 10 versions now, 10 versions of the mailer. And the system, the C version system, will automatically figure out for every customer in your, you know, 40 million customer database, which of these 10 versions is the right one to send to. To give you just one example from direct card. In email, it's more complicated because you know you can manipulate the subject line, you can manipulate the creative in the body of the email, you can you know you can manipulate the offer that they receive. So uh, the platform essentially takes each one of these decisions. So figuring out what to put on the subject line is actually a decision somebody has to make. Okay. It's you know most people don't think of it that way. They think of it okay you know every week I have to send out an email campaign. We come up with a great. There's there there some you know fancy marketer who just. Uh, comes on the you know copy background and come up with the right copy without Absolutely. actually connecting the dots. Right, and that creativity is very important, uh, but it's sort of art alone isn't living up to its potential. You need to have science. So it's the combination that makes the magic happen. Okay. So so the the, the creative a copywriter will come up with seven different versions of the creative, and we will help inform what those versions should be. Mm -hmm. we, for example, we will say if you know subject line has hurry three days only. Other things being equal, that has a 2x effect on the open rate. Okay, so that level of micro. Right. So, but, but, but the key, I think, insight or the, the view we have is that in the, everything you do in a campaign like that is actually a decision. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. may be making the same one that you made the last 24 weeks, mm -hmm. but it still is a decision. So, if you suddenly look at it from a decision point of view and say, okay, this is actually a decision, you know, am I making the right decision? Am I looking at the right set of choices and picking the right one? Mm -hmm. to make the decision, mm -hmm. then suddenly the world changes. Then you go look at your data and say, what sort of experiments do I run, what sort of analysis do I do, to make these decisions sort of at a higher level than they were before. Got it. This is great. This is very helpful. One last question, Rama. Sure. Uh, Groupon, you know, it has, has really taken off in, in all kinds of uh, directions and it's been used by retailers, particularly small ones, for customer acquisition. What do you think they're doing right? And what is the, the the potential of what they could also be doing, whether it's Groupon or, or uh, retailers around Groupon? That's that's a tough question. Um, so my you know my view about Groupon is that obviously the story is you know yet to finish mm -hmm. or yet to be fully revealed. Uh, because I do share this sort of perhaps mild skepticism about the ability for a Groupon induced uh, customer mm -hmm. to become a repeat customer at a higher level of profitability than the original discount they received. So I think there is a risk that you sort of permanently impair your price image if you attract a customer. Is, it, is there any data that's proving it otherwise? I think there was some data profit? from Rice University, uh, I okay. can pick that up a few weeks ago, which suggested that this indeed was happening. Okay. But I think that's only part of the picture. I think, you know, what Groupon has clearly demonstrated is that there is almost an infinite appetite to get a good deal. So I think, you know, uh, which means that the ability for retailers to use price and price cuts as a very important lever to stimulate demand, I think that ability is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Now, retailers would agree that, you know, just doing price cuts across the board is not a good thing for your brand image or your price image, mm -hmm. and you may be permanently impairing your business value. At the same time, Groupon has convincingly shown that price cut alone is a dramatically powerful lever. Hmm. So I think what it means, at least the way I think about it is, retailers should figure out, should build out a capability where they can pinpoint the kinds of price cuts and discounts and coupons that can shape their customer's behavior. Because if you don't do it, or the competition does, it's going to really hurt you. Yeah. So there's a bit of a prisoner's dilemma aspect of the situation. Got it. Uh, where you can't sort of be in, a, in the ivory tower and say, you know, I'm not going to do price cuts because it's going to hurt my brand image. I'm just not going to do it at all because if the competition doesn't, you're going to get hurt. So you have to be in the game and you need to play with it and figure out what sort of prices and price discounts and so on can I use to shape customer behavior they want it to be. Got it. This is very helpful. Thank you, Rama. I appreciate your, your time over here. Thanks for the opportunity. My